Hello everyone! If you regularly watch Ethnomusicology Explained, you'll know that I, like most ethnomusicologists, am an advocate of music as a fundamental cultural structure. Our lives, individual as they all are, would be very different in the absence of music, and many people have questions about the work we do. But perhaps the question I get asked more than any other takes a form similar to this. Why do you spend so much time on music when there are so many more important things, like curing cancer or HIV? At face value, this seems like a legitimate question. Why spend so much time on music? Why not spend your time trying to help people? But the problem with this question is that it involves an implied assumption. The assumption that music isn't important. The assumption that music doesn't relate to helping people whether they're sick or well. Now I'm not going to tell you that blasting out your favorite record will cure diseases. These things are rarely as simple as that. But that's not to say that music can't or isn't being used in ways that encourage health awareness, reduce fear and blame of those affected, and promote well-being among those with chronic or debilitating conditions. In her most recent book, Musical Asylums, Tia Denora states that if one maintains that environmental factors are also involved, illness is never entirely distinct from the conscious and lived experience of those whom it afflicts, and biological determinism is insufficient as an explanation and basis for treatment options. Thus, strongly biologically determined perspectives contain ontologies of health and illness in ways that preclude more nuanced and perhaps more empirically accurate accounts of how we become and stay healthy or ill. The suggestion is that illness and wellness should be considered as together, perhaps as opposite ends of a sliding scale. Our decisions and environment affect our wellness-illness equilibrium, and our decision-making plays a huge role in where we sit on that spectrum. As Judith Stern once said, genetics loads the gun and environment pulls the trigger. Further, it's really important to understand context. That lived experience, consciousness and socioeconomic status, and social and cultural mores and values all intertwine to create a complex fabric with enormous potential to influence behavior and counteract standard preventative medicines or medical discourses. For a great deal of the world's cultures, music and dance play a pivotal role in spiritual healing. From the Sangomas of Southern Africa, to Kalawaya doctors of the Andes in Bolivia, to Christian faith healers in the USA. According to Sprigt and Draw, music has been imbued curative, therapeutic and other medical value throughout history. Musicians, therapists, philosophers, as well as other artists and scholars alike have documented its physical, mental, and social effects in treatises from as early as 4000 BC to the present. Clearly, if not magic, something's going on here. And there are some observations that can be made at simple face value. Perhaps the most obvious of these is within music making itself. Music can be, sometimes simultaneously, engaging, distracting, physical, emotional, ambiguous, social, communicative, can affect behavior, can affect identity, and so much more. These powerful effects can undoubtedly have significant impact on one's wellness-illness equilibrium, particularly when it comes to mental health. Perhaps one of the more established areas of music and health is music therapy. Established in the 1950s, it utilizes sonic interactions, relationships, and environments to form a non-pharmacological therapy to achieve varied and subject-specific results, ranging from improved cognition or emotional development to basic motor functions or communication. Music therapy has largely only been endorsed in treating behavioral or, or developmental disorders or in the process of rehabilitation. But studies have shown, including this one, link in the doobly-doo, that music therapy can indeed be effective in reducing the behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia and other degenerative brain diseases, as well as a whole plethora of other applications from stroke rehabilitation to anxiety reduction prior to major surgery. Don't get me wrong though, I'm a strong advocate of science and medicine and would never suggest unproven alternative therapies over medically proven treatments. But we underestimate the potential of musical, socially interactive experiences, and further underestimate our physiological and psychological symbiosis. Although the medical humanities and social sciences such as medical anthropology and medical ethnomusicology are making progress to incorporate a human and conscious element to medicine and public health, there's still a way to go. There are a number of ways in which music can be thought of as complementing healthcare. This might include music therapy, community music, everyday musical experience, traditional healings, or music in education. Music is often a component of health-related public engagement strategies, because it's popular, because people listen to it, 
it's ubiquitous. Anything from jeans to iPhones are sold through music, and the same applies to selling ideas, selling health. When was the last time you heard a commercial without music? Unless you were born in the 40s and 50s, and let's face it, internet, you really weren't. It's probably never happened. From the Bonos and Band-Aids, Geldofs and We Are The Worlds, to local community awareness and prevention, music has formed a pillar on which much health advocacy has been built. In short, does music heal the sick? No, it doesn't. But often that's not the point. Music can help educate those about risky health behaviour in order to prevent health problems or promote understanding for those already affected. In certain contexts, music is at least able to contribute something to the healing process. Perhaps it distracts from pain. Maybe it engages the body's internal reward system and floods the brain with dopamine to help cope. Maybe it triggers memories previously lost in the fog of a degenerative brain disease, if even for a short while. Like in this clip. Hi, Papa. Huh? How are you doing? I'm all right. I'm fine. Who, Wait. Who am I? I don't know. Wait a minute. I don't Yeah. Henry. Yes, yeah, bro. I found your music. Uh, you, want, you want your music now? Well, not me. Oh, I'm okay. Ready. Let's try your music, okay? And then you tell me if it's too loud or not. Then he is given an iPod containing we know his favorite music. And immediately, he, he lights up. His face assumes expression, his eyes open wide. He, uh, he starts to, um, to sing and to rock and to move his arms, and he's being animated by the music. The effect of this doesn't stop, because when the, uh, the, the headphones are taken off, uh, Henry, normally mute and virtually unable to answer the simplest yes or no questions, is quite voluble. Henry? Yeah? Did you like music when you were young? Yes, yes, I went to big dances and things. W what was your favorite music when you were young? Oh, well, uh, well, I guess, uh, well, Cab Calloway was my number one band guy I liked. The 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 holy the holy the holy the holy the holy the holy the holy. What's your favorite favorite Cab Calloway song? Oh, I'm the old of Christmas. Oh, you can count plans on me with plenty of snow, mistletoe. Present, Reverend, you three, ow! So, in some sense, Henry is restored to himself. He has uh, uh, remembered uh, who he is, and uh, he's, he's reacquired his, his identity for a while through the power of music. What, what does music do, do to you? Give me the feeling of love. No, no man, figure right now the world needs to come into music singing, you got beautiful music in. Beautiful, oh, lovely. And uh, I feel the band of love, the dream. You can have all the music which is significant for you in something as big as a matchbox or, or whatever. And I think this, this, this may be very, very important in uh, helping to animate, organize, uh, and uh, bring a sense of identity back to people who are, who are out of it. Otherwise, music will bring them back into it, into their own personhood, their own memories, their own autobiographies. In light of this, does it really matter that music can't magically cure anything? No, it doesn't. When music and the arts are present within the healing process, they form a complementary approach to physical healthcare that helps to deal with people rather than just diseases. The humanity of healthcare. If you have any questions or comments, then feel free to post in the comment section below. And if you want to keep learning about ethnomusicology, musicology, or music in general, then you can go to youtube.com forward slash ethnomusicexplained and subscribe. And as always, I'll see you soon.